All right. We're going to go ahead and move into 26203. Um, we're looking at electric lighting. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen here and we'll get into PowerPoint real quick. All right. Human vision light lamps. Uh, these will be the objectives for this particular one. Identify how the human eye operates, identify the characteristics of light. Please read the trade terms here. Incident light, luminaire, meaning lighting fixture, luminance, reflected, reflective light, and refracted. I highly encourage everyone, if you haven't started reading this module, read the module, read every, matter of fact, read the whole thing. It's actually uh, going back through it and, you know, just, it brings back, uh, you know, things I seem to have forgotten or hadn't used in a while. And it just uh, it was a good, uh, good refresher to go back into it. So I highly encourage um, everyone before, uh, even, you know, either before or after you watch this video, please go through and actually read it in its entirety. Um, so we're going to get started. All right, electric lighting is used extensively uh, throughout residential structures, commercial businesses, industrial plants, outdoor sites. Um, its use in residential structures can create ambience and provide illumination for various tasks. So moving on to 1.1.0, the human eye. Uh, human vision is the process that occurs partly in the eye and partly in the brain. Light reflected from objects stimulates the eye. This stimulation is conveyed to the brain where it registered as a conscious sensation. The structure of the eye is similar to many ways uh, to a film camera, which consists of a lens system, a variable diaphragm, and a film. The variable diaphragm would be in reference to the iris of the eye, and the film would be the retina. Light enters through the eye through a transparent layer called the cornea. That is a uh, reference to the test question right there. Um, light enters the eye through a transparent layer called the cornea. The amount of light that is allowed to strike the lens is controlled by contraction and expansion of the iris. During low light, low light levels, the iris expands and during high light levels, it does contract. It moderates that amount of uh, light entering into the eye. All right, turning the page here, uh, we're going to look at the three different um, uh, limits of vision, and um, that's going to be intensity threshold. Actually, it's, oh, it's actually seven, seven different. Uh, limitation or limits of vision uh, determined mainly by the following intensity threshold uh, contrast visual angle time threshold and other characteristics of vision are high contrast sharp edges uh, straight lines are easier to see uh, the background surrounding an object changes its appearance for example a gray object appears lighter uh, when it's placed on a black background that appears darker when placed on the light, a white background. All right, so 1.2, actually, let's go to characteristic light, 1.2.0. When discussing light, most people think of natural light from the sun or the light emitted from a light source, such as an electric light bulb. This type of light is called in incident light. Another type of light is called reflected light. So going on to 1.2.1, the absorption and reflection of and refraction of light. So three things can happen when light strikes an object or surface. Some of the light can be absorbed. Some can be transmitted through ob object media and refracted or diffused. And some can be reflected back from the surface. Absorption occurs when the light rays pass through a transparent or translucent medium to meet a dense body such as an opaque reflector surface. Now, what that means is obviously you have some objects that are going to absorb uh, light and heat, uh, or it'll absorb light through heat. The other one's going to be reflection, and the other one's going to be refraction. Refraction, obviously, if we look in figure three right here, um, says direct in 
incident light rays. So if it's reflected, it means it bounces off. If it's absorbed, it goes straight in. And if it's refracted, it means that it will uh, partially absorb. So we're going to look down here at table one. Let's see, here it is. So percentages of light reflected uh, by common surface, the color of walls, ceilings, and floors, and their degree of reflection are major considerations in the design of effective lighting systems. And if you'll look here, white plaster has a percentage of light that's reflected. Obviously white reflects, right? 90-92%. Uh, but let's look down at the dark red glazed bricks. If it's not reflecting it or refracting it, it is absorbing it. So uh, that is a twist uh, question. That's a test question. Um, and the test question actually, I want to say is worded. How is it worded here? I know I saw it here earlier. Oh, there was just the wrong section right there. That's not what I was looking for. Okay, so so it says, which of the following materials absorbs the light, the most light? Uh, concrete, which is a 40% uh, reflective right there. Uh, red dark bricks, dark red bricks, stainless steel and white paint. Obviously stainless steel is 55 to 65 and white paint is 75 to 90%. So dark red glazed bricks is going to be the um, answer for that one when it says absorbs the most light. All right, so moving on. All right, 2.1.1. Um, actually, let's go 2.1.0. There are four main categories of lamps used for lighting. Think about it real quick. So we have all these different types of light. The two, actually the three most common are going to be, um, well, there it is right there. Incandescent, LED, fluorescent. Now, of course, the one that you probably aren't as familiar with are gonna be these HIDs, the high in intensity discharge lamps. And we're going to go into those uh, in more detail, but the HIDs are uh, very similar to a um, uh, fluorescent. However, they uh, they are they're under a lot of pressure, so if it discharges improperly, they can't explode. All right, so once again, let's look at the trade terms here now. So uh, you got ballast, color rendering index (CRI), dip tolerance efficiency, or I'm sorry, efficacy, which is the light output of a light source divided by the total power input to that source. It is expressed in lumens per watt or LPW. Then you have incandescence, lumen, uh, lumen maintenance, and lumens per watts, LPW, and starter. So please, please, please go in there and make sure you guys are, uh, guys and gals are uh, looking over those trade terms before you get started here. Makes, just, just makes reading it more comprehensive. All right, so incandescent lights, like the one shown there in the picture, produced, uh, produces uh, light by passing an electric current through a filament. Incandescent lamps are very inefficient and have been phased out of production as of 2014. However, you can go to Lowe's, Ace Hardware, pretty much any store and continue to purchase them. All right, so incandescent lamps were invented over a hundred years ago and their basic construction remains the same. They're also called filament lamps and used for general lighting and provide a warm and natural light. To go even further, an incandescent lamp Light is generated by passing electrical current through the filament and its resistance causes it to heat to uh, incandescence. So that little filament right up there, right there, will get super hot because you have, obviously this is the envelope here, has gas in here, has your lead wires, there's your base. So this base is your negative. And then of course here on one of these leads is your hot, and whenever you touch them two together, 
would typically get an arc and probably trip the breaker, but when it's in an, a, an envelope that has no oxygen, well, if it's no oxygen, then therefore it can't create an arc. It can't, can't create a fire. So what it does is it superheats that tinsel, uh, that, that tungsten um, filament right there, and it superheats. Well, the heat gets so hot that it actually produces the incandescent light. So therefore, that's why uh, that rascal is like that. All right, the hotter the film it gets, the more efficient it is in converting electricity to light output. However, it should be pointed out that when a filament operates hotter, its life is shortened. This makes the design of each type of lamp a trade-off between do you want efficiency or do you want lamp life? So please, I'm gonna foot stomp that one right now. It should be pointed out that when, when a filament operates hotter, its life is shortened, okay? If you know what that means. All right. How much of the energy consumed by incandescent lamps is dissipated as heat? Hmm. That's a good question. Let's see. I don't know. Well, let me see here. I might actually have that answer right here. All right, I'll come back to that. Um, I am pretty sure that it's going to be right here. Two point point one here. I think they give you the answer here. All right, I'll follow back on that one. But I have a feeling that it's going to be uh, how much of the energy consumed by incandescent lamps dissipated as heat. I have a strong feeling that it's going to be somewhere around 50 to 75 percent, one of those two. Okay. All right, so moving on. Da -da 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 -da, five minutes, five minutes, six. We're going to 2.1.2, tungsten halogen incandescent lamps. 2.1.2, there we go. Halogen lamps are the most efficient, they're more efficient than incandescent lamps and also have a greater service life and volatile quality life. However, halogen lamps burn hot and produce more ultraviolet radiation than other lamps, okay? We used to use these primarily for uh, exterior floodlights because we want to produce a tremendous amount of light for uh, exterior and uh, and we really weren't worried about heat because of obviously if they're attached to an, an open lens uh, fixture and they're outside that it wouldn't pose that much more of a problem. But it says right here, 2.2, tungsten halogen incandescent lamps are a refinement over the standard incandescent lamps. Um, they have, uh, they provide greater efficiency, um, longer service life, and 2,000 to 5,000 average hours, and improved light quality. Their light output uh, contains more blue and less yellow than standard incandescent lamps, making their light appear whiter and brighter. Um, Let's see, then 2.1.3, we talk about LEDs, light emitting diodes, uh, lamps. They're rapidly gaining popularity. Some of the latest ultra, ultra high brightness LEDs can output light with a illumination efficiency of 100 lumens per watt at 350 milliamp. All right. Oh, there they are. All right generate a little heat, have long lifespans, um, various semiconductors, materials are used to produce different colors, drivers provide the low power, low voltage power supply for LED lights. Architectural LEDs and SSLs, 
uh, solid state lighting. Um, yeah, there's just various different types of light bulbs there. Let's see. We're going to talk about fluorescent lamps right here real quick before we go any further. Fluorescent lamps are low pressure mercury discharge lamps that are very energy efficient to 75 to 100 LPWs and have a long service life, 12,000 to more than 24,000 average hours. Each requires a ballast for effectively start, uh, to effectively start the lamp and regulate its operation. Light is produced by passing an electric arc between two tungsten cathodes at opposite ends of a glass tube filled with low pressure mercury vapor. All right, so let's look right here. So these are our two uh, pins at the end. All right, and this is our cathode uh, shield right here. So this is our cathode. Um, has a phosphor coating uh, over the lens. Has mercury vapor inside. And then the mercury atom right here ignites to create ultraviolet radiation um, in it whenever it's excited there. Okay, so the arc excites the atoms of the mercury. This generates UV radiation to cause this phosphor coating on the inside of the tube of fluorescence and produce visible light. All right, it goes on to say fluorescent bulbs are made in straight, U-bent, circular, and compact varieties as shown in figure 13 right here. Look at all the different ones. Uh, fluorescent lamps are designed by the letter T followed by the diameter of the lamp tube expressed in eighths of an inch. In the United States, they vary in diameter from T5 to power groove 17. Um, and overall length, straight fluorescent lamps range from six inches all the way up to eight feet or 96 inches. Higher wattages go with longer bulbs. For example, a 20 watt straight T12 tube is shorter than a 40 watt T12 tube. Fluorescent lamps have two electrical requirements. To start the lamp, a high voltage surge is needed to establish an arc in the mercury vapor. Once the lamp is started, the gas offers a decreasing amount of resistance, which means that current must be regulated to match that drop. So, in a, so as opposed to an incandescent, which has that tungsten filament, uh, this gas doesn't have that resistance. So therefore, it doesn't require the amount of energy to maintain that lamp's uh, uh, light because it's working off of fluorescence. So once you ignite that mercury at a higher voltage, obviously, because that's the whole purpose of the ballast is to regulate the amount of voltage going in and out of that tube. And what happens is once that initial arc has been created, then the tube's gonna to continue to work so long as there's voltage being applied. And the purpose of that ballast is to moderate and maintain the proper amount of voltage going in there. So typically when you see a lamp that starts brightening and dimming, brightening and dimming, not necessarily a flicker so much as just brightening and dimming, then there's a good chance your ballast is actually starting to go out. Now, if you have a light that you can turn on and then you stop, you turn off and turn it back on and then the light kicks on, that could be the starter inside that actual uh, light fixture. And if it doesn't have a starter, then there's a built-in starter in the ballast and therefore uh, the ballast is about to go out as well. So. All right, so fluorescent lamps have two electrical requirements. To start the lamp, a high voltage surge is needed to establish an arc in the mercury vapor. Once the lamp is started, the gas offers a decreasing amount of resistance, which means that the current must be regulated to match this drop. Otherwise, the lamp would draw more and more and more power and rapidly burn itself out. This is why fluorescent lamps are operated in a lighting fixture circuits containing a ballast that provides the required voltage surge to start up and then controls the subsequent flow of current to the lamp. All right, so. There are three electrical classes of fluorescent lamps and lighting fixture, preheat, rapid start, and instant start. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the term preheat refers to the lighting fixture circuit used with fluorescent lamps, wherein the lamp electrodes are heated or warmed to a glow stage with replaceable starter separate from the ballast. Okay, we talked about that. So it means you got a fixture, 
you actually have a little miniature starter that actually I'm looking in the book here to see if they had any big, they look like a mini, uh, um, man, what is I thinking of? It is a, uh, capacitor. It's like a miniature capacitor. So when you ignite electricity to it, it produces a larger amount of current to, uh, to actually produce the electricity. So when power is applied to the lighting fixture, starter functions to preheat the lamp's cathode or the uh, lamp is started. The term rapid start refers to a lighting fixture circuit designed to start the lamp by continuously heating or preheating the lamp electrodes by means of a heater winding built into the ballast. The term instant starter refers to a lighting fixture circuit used to start specifically design lamps without the aid of a starter. To strike the arc instantly, the circuit uses a higher open circuit voltage than is required for a preheat or rapid start lamp of the same length. A voltage that is approximately three times the normal lamp operation, operating voltage. Here's the test question. Both preheat and rapid start lamps have a bi-pin, which means two, base at each end, instant start lamps have a single pin at each end. You have to remember guys, the instant start lamps have a single pin at each end. Single start lamps, single pin. Okay. We'll move on down to HID. These are your compact fluorescents. There's a classic bulb shaped fluorescent. These are your tombstones or lamp holders. Um, Single pin, two pin, two pin, right? High intensity discharge lamps provide both long life and high efficiency. They are somewhat similar to fluorescent lamps in that they produce light when electricity excites specific gases and pressurized bulbs. An arc is established between two electrodes, meaning two wires in a gas-filled tube, which causes mercury vapor to produce radiant energy. Unlike a fluorescent lamp, a combination of factors shift the wavelength of much of the energy to within the visible range, so light is produced without phosphorus. First, the electrodes are only a few inches apart at opposite ends of the sealed R2, and the gases in the tube are highly pressurized. This allows the arc to generate extremely high temperatures, causing metallic elements within the gas atmosphere to vaporize and release large amounts of visible radiant energy. Like fluorescent lamps, HID lamps must be used in matching light fixtures with a ballast specifically designed for that lamp and that wattage. There are three types of HID lamps. You have mercury vapor, metal halide, and highly pressurized sodium high pressure sodium. I think that's them right there. Yep. All right. So let's talk about metal halide here. Um, see here right here in figure 17. Uh, are very energy efficient source of white light. They have a high efficiency of 80 to 150 LPW, excellent color rendition, long service life to more than 20,000 average hours, and good lumen maintenance uh, longevity. So the test question part of this is going to be that it uh, has excellent color rendition. So out of your HIDs, your metal halide lamps. All right, so continue to talk about color here. Color rendi rendering and color temperature. This right here. All right, 2.1.6 here, guys. Colors appear differently under various light sources. The color rendering index, a scale from zero to 100, is used by lamp manufacturers to indicate how normal and natural a specific lamp makes objects appear. Let's scroll down real quick. 
under where it says uh, lamps can create atmospheres that are warm or cool in appearance. The color temperature expressed in kelvins is one way a lamp manufacturer describes the color tone, which means the warmth or coolness produced by a lamp. All right. And the one I want you to really focus on here, um, I mean, we can talk about different ones, but the one I want you to kind of take away is a color temperature of 3,500 kel kelvins is considered moderate in tone, producing a balance between both warmth and coolness. So remember, 3,500 Kelvin is considered moderate. Okay. 2.1.7. We're installing lamps. Now, the reason this is important because you're like, oh, you just grab a bulb and you screw it in, or hey, you grab a bulb and you slip it in and turn it around, you know, turn it a 90 degrees or whatever it is for that particular lamp. Some of these bulbs, and I recommend it every one of these bulbs, you take good care to know what kind of bulb you're dealing with and how do you install it. Um, so going moving forward here. So you want to make sure your lamp and lighting fixture are compatible. Don't put the wrong bulb in the wrong fixture. If you put a T12 bulb in a T8 fixture, they're not going to work correctly. Okay. Um, yeah. So make sure the lamp and lighting fixtures, they match each other. Even though it may be a, uh, for example, this uh, HID, you want to make sure that it meets the voltage that the fixture actually has. Uh, you can get a light bulb that works off of 12 volts, and you put it in a 120-volt uh, light fixture, and it's going to blow it because it's designed for a different voltage altogether. So just make sure that you're putting the right stuff in the right fixture. All right. Skip on down a little bit. Make sure that you do not install a lamp or combination of lamps in the lighting fixture that exceeds the wattage rating. So if it tells you maximum wattage is 60 watts, don't put a 75. If it says 40, for example, most recessed can lights that are in showers require no more than 40 watts of lamp or uh, no larger than 40 watt lamp. Well, people used to put 60s in there and then their light would go out. Why did it go out? Because that 60 watt puts up too, many heat, too much heat. And you're putting a lens cover over it, so that just traps that heat. It, you know, it transfers that heat right through that metal, and then there's a thermal sensor in there that would trip, and therefore your shower light, after only being on for a couple minutes, all of a sudden it goes off. And then later at night, middle of the night, the light comes back on because you didn't turn the switch. So just be mindful to put the right size bulb in the right fixture. Do not exceed that, uh, that temperature or that wattage. When installing a fluorescent HID lamp, make sure the lamp type and wattages are matched. We talked about that. Use a, here's the thing about halogen. All right. When you're talking about the halogen tuber, you have to either wear cotton gloves or use a paper towel or something when handling these bulbs. The main reason is um, we want to make sure that we don't get any grease, oil, or anything like that on, um, on the bulb because it says right here, use a soft cloth or gloves to handle an uncapsulated halogen tuber lamp. This prevents oil from your hands from can contact contacting the bulb. This is important because it's quartz glass. Uh, walls can withstand high operating temperatures but may crack if etched with oil. Also make sure no combustible materials can come in contact with the lamps. All right. In general, all right, so I'm scrolled down just a couple more uh, paragraphs here. Um, in general, Energy uh, legislation promotes replacing standard incandescent lamps with LED and compact fluorescent lamps. Replacing incandescent reflector lamps with halogen PARs and using high efficiency fluorescent lamps such as T5s instead of full wattage type. The main reason is because it's about energy consumption. LEDs, fluorescent, HID, um, they're all high, high efficiency, low cost. So. Uh, you lose use less uh, electricity. Well, we consider that being more efficient. So. 
fluorescence and HID fixture. We're on 2.2.0, talking about the ballast. Require the use of a ballast. The main function of a ballast is to provide the voltage needed to strike an arc between the electrodes. All right, so if we were scroll in on this, it's in your book. It gives you the advantage, disadvantage of each one of these type of light bulbs, lamps. So please take a chance, uh, opportunity and make sure you are Look at that. So the common reading that, that CRI is a scale that indicates how natural objects appear under artificial light. Uh, lamps are also rated by color temperature and kelvins. And we talked about 3,500 is the moderate between um, balance between warmth and coolness. So, all right, so 2.2.1, fluorescent lighting fixture ballasts for, let's see here. All right, so let me see which one this is here. All right, we're gonna go into the uh, session two now. There we go. Let's see, level two to session two. Yes, it is. Okay. So, fluorescent HID lamps require ballast, provide voltage required, uh, surge required to spike an arc between the electrodes. We talked about that. Ballast to regulate the current and compensate for voltage variations. All right. Um, regulate electrical current. Uh, supply the correct voltage required for proper lamp operation, provide continuous voltage to maintain heat in the lamp electrode while the lamp operates. Fluorescent ballasts uh, are made to operate in three basic fluorescent lighting fixture operating circuits. You have preheat, rapid start, and instant start. We've talked about those. Um, now we're gonna move on over. So if you'll move on down, we're just talking about the three different types. Um, obviously we got rapid start and ballast operation. And then we got, all right, so instant start lamp and ballast operation. The lamp electrodes in the instant start lamps are not preheated. The ballast provides a high voltage, 100 volt to 1000 volt, across the electrodes that causes the electron to be emitted from the cathodes as shown in figure 19. That's figure 19. I think that's figure 19. Yeah, figure 19, there it is. Yep. All right. So that's a test question. Instant start lamp and ballast operations. The lamp electrodes in the instant start lamps are not preheated. The ballast provides a high voltage across the electrodes that causes electrons to be emitted from the electrodes as shown in figure 19. Okay. So moving on over, we're going to talk about some categories of ballasts. We got standard ballast, high efficiency ballast, hybrid ballast, electronic start, rapid start ballast. And then you have your electronic start, instant start ballast. Now, on this particular one, all right, let's see where we at here. Dimmer, HID. I have no idea where I'm at. I don't think that's where I'm at. All right, when we talk about an electronic instant start ballast as the lowest system wattage and the highest system efficiency, this lamp life is slightly shorter than with the rapid start ballast. However, it saves electricity, it's the most efficient. Um, so, I'm not real sure where my question went. Let's show this over here. And the question is, instant start balance. There it is. Which of the following provides high voltage across the lamp's electrodes that start up causing them to emit electrons 
That's going to be your instant start ballast. All right, 2.2.2, .2. HID lighting fixture ballast. HID lamps require the use of a ballast to provide enough voltage to strike the arc in the lamp. This function may be accomplished by the ballast itself or in conjunction with a separate electronic igniter and starter. The igniter uh, is the electronic device used in the uh, circuitry for high pressure sodium and some metal halide lamps. It provides a pulse of at least 2,500 volt peak root means to initiate the lamp arc. When the system is generalized, the igniter provides the required pulse until the lamp is completely lit and they automatically stop pulsing. So physically, there are numerous types and shapes of ballasts with HID lamps. The same is true electronically. Some ballasts are made with primary leads that allow the ballast to be connected to the different voltage supplies, 12208, 24277. Such ballasts are called multi-tap ballasts. It's extremely important that the only proper voltage lead be connected to the supply voltage. Make sure you look at your ballast and make sure that it matches the voltage that you are bringing into it. Uh, you don't want to burn it up or blow up something. So HID ballasts can be grouped into three basic categories. One is linear. Uh, which is non-regulating circuit ballast, constant wattage auto transformer ballast, and three coil ballast. That's a test question. Of the HID ballast that can be grouped into three basic categories, the one you want to be consistent with or, or familiar with is the constant wattage auto associated. Which of the following is an HID ballast category? Constant wattage auto transformer is one of them. Okay, go on through. Moving on. All right, so we're still in 2.2.2, but we've flipped all the way over to page 25. Uh, constant wattage auto transformers. Uh, ballast shown in figure 23 is a, look here, figure 23, there we go. It says A, B, C, there we go. Constant wattage auto transformer. Uh, is a ballast circuit that uses magnetic saturation to maintain a better lamp, wattage circuit, uh, wattage regulation to improve your dip tolerance. Your three coil ballast is isolated winding ballast with, in which the input and lamp windings are separated by a third winding which helps eliminate the dramatic changes in the demands of the lamp. All right. 3.1.3, lighting fixtures. Golly, there are so many different type of light fixtures. Um, there's no way we can be able to cover all of them as far as talking about them, but we'll give it a go. All right, so suspended lighting fixtures. Let's go to that one. There's surface mount, surface mount, typical uh, lighting. That's all, uh, looks like recessed right here. Uh, Troffers. Troffers means they actually set into a ceiling grid. Yep, just like that. That's your ceiling grid above your ceiling, uh, what we call a drop ceiling. Suspended lighting circuits. Uh, suspended lighting fixtures include chandeliers and pendants. That's actually a test question. Chandeliers and pendants are considered a suspended lighting fixture. Okay. 3.2.0. Um, prior to insulation, it is extremely important that lamps and lighting fixtures be handled and stored properly both while in transit and at the job site. All right, the lamps or lighting fixtures are not going to be installed immediately. Store them in a dry place where they'll be protected. Uh, when operating, opening a lighting fixture, just don't just rip into the box. Uh, a couple of things. If you if you cut into it too deep with a knife and you end up cutting the fixture, then you just ruin the fixture. So make sure that you are open it uh, and handling the boxes and so forth accordingly. So the uh, one of the, the question, uh, I guess, the test question focus would be when handling the fixture itself, 
Wear gloves in order to prevent any grease, dirt, or et cetera, on your hands from getting on its finished and decorative surfaces. All right, right along. Track lighting. Um, when you're dealing with track lighting, I a test question. Track lighting. If I can find it here. There we go. All right, so let's talk about it real quick. Uh, uh, flange hangers. That was going to be one of the questions here. So, suspended lighting fixtures used in commercial and industrial buildings can be used in numerous ways depending on the construction of the building and the particular lighting application. Figure 44. Let's back it up. Okay, where's 44? That's 43. 44. I don't see them. Interesting. Okay. Um, they very well could be in the next section. Um, anyway, talk about flange hangers or uh, they're a type of hanger commonly used to attach supporting rods, cables, chains uh, to the building structure, remember. So it's going to ask you um, essentially questions like that. So I'm looking here and the actual test question is, Chandelier, which is a life operating suspended. A flange hanger is commonly used with a suspended picture. Okay. All right. So, all right. So let me go ahead and we'll let's see. All right, so let me there, 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 there. All right, so installing lighting fixtures. Surface mounted lights. I'm not sure what's happened here. It seems like I've Things skipped over quite a bit here. So we'll, we'll go over a couple things real quick. Um, so sections 410, 151, 410, 155 cover the insulation requirements for track lighting. Track is mounted directly to the ceiling or wall using screws, toggle bolts, or other applicators. Fasteners installed through holes in the track. When installing uh, installed on a wall, the track must be at least five foot above the finished floor except for protected from physical damage or when the use of low voltage uh, track. All right, so now let's talk about modular wiring systems. Um, I'm not seeing that anywhere on here. So I don't think so. Oh, shoot. There's a track hangers. Okay, I just hadn't, I was talking beyond uh, this. So anyway, Let's, uh, modular system wiring, alternative conventional wired wiring. An outer junction box installed at the starting point of a feeder adapter is wired to a mount plate. The rest of the wiring is installed using connector. As you can see, they're just, they're actually pre-attached uh, and just a plug and play. Now, the thing to know about them is component labels are color coded by voltage. Depending on the actual voltage going into that fixture, it's going to have a specific color on it. So uh, component labels are color coded by voltage and the units are keyed to prevent mismatching voltage. All right. Um, yeah, that's just basic wiring is all that is. All right. Let's go here, 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 there. 
to share my screen. Awesome. Okay. Occupancy sensors. So an occupancy sensor can be motion detecting, heat sensing, or infrared sound sensing. Okay. Thing to, to take away from that is motion sensor. Okay. Uh, we use those in buildings. Uh, they can be recessed, surface mounted, wall mounted, ceiling mounted, and they're uh, turns the light on when it senses someone coming into the room. And turns off after some time after not sensing any presence. Photo sensors uh, sense the level of visible light in the surrounding area and convert this light to an electrical signal. Just like that. We've all seen those in the homes. Some units include infrared sensors such as motion detectors. Thing to know about that is when photo sensors are used outdoors, the sensor should be uh, aimed due north. All right, timers. Timers are used uh, to turn on lighting in or off the response known to schedule sequences. Time clocks are often used in conjunction with photo cells in order to turn off lighting when there is no longer a need for it. For example, an industrial building may use a photo sensor signal to activate outdoor lighting at dusk when a time clock to turn off the lighting after the last worker has left the facility. Right. Emergency management systems. Uh, modern buildings normally use some form of an energy management system to economically control the amount of energy consumed by the building's lighting circuits and HVAC equipment. That is a test question. Um, an EMS typically uh, consists of a computer or control processor, uh, energy management and scheduling software sensors and controls located uh, where needed and in large systems and communication networks. All right, please continue uh, on page 55, do the section review question. Each section has a section review, but do the review questions at the end as well. Um, then there's the supplemental exercises that need to be taken care of as well. Once again, Please read the trade terms in this module, and I think you'll have no problem with this lesson. If you have any more questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to me, and uh, we'll talk about them as needed. Have a good day.